Hi, this is James Yoakum, host of Web Comics Reviews and Interviews. And tonight, we're looking at horror tropes and how they should work. So sit back, relax, and let the Geek Fest begin. When you visit a theme park, you usually go straight towards the roller coaster. Yeah, you might stop off or two, but you're going to hit the roller coaster. Because no matter what, you know that if you hit that roller coaster, you know it's going to go up, you know it's going to go down, you know it's going to go around, you know it's going upside down. Heck, you know it's going to go loop to loop. But you can count on the fact that it's going to shock you and it's going to thrill you, and odds are it's going to cause you to want to throw up. That's all part of the ride, all part of the excitement. But, even though it's ultra predictable, and let's get real, you've had more than a op- major opportunity to study it as you came in, so you have a general idea of what's going to go on, that actually helps build up a lot of the anticipation. And once you've got that anticipation up to a fever pitch, you know, right when you're about to board the ride and just take off and go for it, well, at that point, the ride starts really kicking in. The basic gist is is that there's a little bit of a ritual to it. And that's the same way with a lot of the horror comics. A lot of people, when they start reading the horror comics, it's not just something you'd read on the bus or, you know, on the way to work or whatever. It's not something you're going to be reading in the library. I mean, if you have to, sure, but let's get real. A lot of the fun with a good horror comic is taking a late night, turning off all the lights except for the one you need, getting under something comfortable like a good old-fashioned wool blanket, and making sure you've got something that to drink and eat nearby. Because when you sit down and start reading the horror comic, you're going to try to read it from end to end as much as possible. And that's actually sort of the fun of it. You know, it's a, it's a literary version of a campfire tale. It, reading the comic in and of itself isn't fun. There's, you've got to go through with all the little rituals. Only once you've start, uh, committed yourself to the ritual and then started reading the horror comic, you know, that's when all the fun happens. Now, admittedly, there's a lot of stuff you can't do in a horror comic that you can do in a more cinematic thing. Like, jump scares just don't really work too well. You know, we see the cat come out and everybody has a heart attack. Well, when it comes down to it, you know, a horror comic is all sorts of fun. Well, I'm taking a step back for just a moment. If you're serious about horror comics, what I sort of suggest are two things. One, going back and all the way back to the 50s and grabbing the EC comics. Um, in 1954, the seduction of the innocent implosion happened and killed a lot of comics. Unfortunately, this meant that horror comics had to go because they were just way too scary. And so... They didn't really get going again until roughly the 1970s again, when you could actually start having supernatural elements. However, um, EC comics were probably the scariest of the lot and definitely checking out. Um, For a little bit more modern take, well, keep in mind a lot of EC comics would be translated into the small screen thanks to HBO's run of Tales of the Crypt. And if you can track that down, definitely do so. Uh, while you're at it, track down the original Creep Show. Again, you're going to be seeing a lot of the old comic stuff, even though they're comics written by Stephen King, which is sort of cool in and of itself. But uh, Creep Show also tends to be really close as far as trying to keep a lot of the comic things going on. And so it tends to get a little bit funky here and there, but definitely worth a ride. Like I said, it's a roller coaster thing. You know it's going to be predictable, you know the tropes. But you're going to have a little bit of fun with it. So again, um, the big three there are EC Comics, Tales of the Crypt, and Creepshow. With that in mind, I think it's going to be a little bit interesting as a writer to sort of explore the tropes of the average horror. Not necessarily because... See, one of the problems with having a trope is that even though it's a really great little shortcut and it provides a nice sense of familiarity... And once you establish a sense of familiarity, you know, so this is the area of the familiar, you can then take that little bit of familiarity and use it to catapult people wherever you want to. At that point, hey, they're going to suspend disbelief a lot better as long as they know they've got something that they can touch on. So, 
that's why we have that's why people tend to have tropes. They're a nice bits of familiarity and once you've established that familiarity, well yeah, you get the picture. The only problem is that over time a lot of tropes become cliches. And you've either got to either discover new tropes and incorporate those into your writing, or you need to re explore why the tropes became cliches and if there is actually any actual well meat to them bones. So what I'm going to do tonight is go through a lot of the common tropes that you see in a lot of horror and see if there's a way to see why they work in terms of the inner universe stuff. That is, we know why stuff works outside the universe. We know why we need to have a serial you know, We need to know why we have a slash killer. Screw it. I'm going to go slash killer because serial killer isn't quite accurate. That is, where the serial killer has a cooling off period... And then they start killing again, and then they have another cooling off period. A serial killer will just simply go for it until they're stopped. Or not stopped. You know? Some of them actually do have a rhythm. But, the key here is that it'd be sort of fun to see if there's actually a reason for the killer to exist within the universe. And have an actual, you know, an actual origin of sorts. Rather than simply saying, hey, this is a literary device, I need to use it. You know, we all know about the final girls. We know that if we're doing it right, we're going to have somebody who's, you know, gotten stronger, retained their core morality, and is able to use that core morality to defeat the bad guy. Usually this is a girl, and therefore why it's called a final girl. It's usually the last person standing. So, but it'd be sort of interesting to go through a lot of the tropes and see if there's a little bit of flesh there that we can actually have a little bit of fun with. And not just treat them as actual literary devices, as merely literary devices, but actual entities in and of themselves. So, with that said, here's ten basic tropes and having a little bit of fun with them. So first off, obviously, we're going to start with the Slash Killer. Um... Horror movie, for lots of great examples. Jason, Michael, Freddy. You get the idea. These are characters that tend to basically come off as they're going to come basically kill whoever they possibly can. Each one of them has usually a group of targets. Jason goes after teenagers. Uh, Freddy goes after specifically children of those who killed him on Elm Street. And Michael has an even more select group where he happens to go after living relatives and anybody who gets in between him and those relatives. These killers tend to have a very strict morality code that they tend to enforce. And anybody who goes against that morality code tends to, well, it's not a pretty sight. You can see this, start seeing this in comics. Um, most particularly, check out Death Note, where you basically have a teenage boy who finds... A notebook, he's able to use that notebook to enforce his personal views of morality onto the world by killing off people who, well, aren't exactly all that moral. You know, greedy bankers, murderers, rapists, so on and so forth. The question here is what creates a slash killer? That is, what in universe events end up causing this to happen? Well, First off, the most obvious is that the slash killers had some sort of authority-related major traumatic event. That is, they were bullied, they were, well, raped, um, they were attacked by somebody who was in authority over them, and somehow or another, in their psychotic mind, they had to become an authority in order to take control over the life. And then once they've taken control over their life, they've decided to take control over other people's lives, becoming this literal authority over death, life and death. On top of that, because they are authorities, they tend to take it way too seriously and go after it with a black and white morality. In essence, these people these go from being people all the way over to becoming almost supernatural entities. And once they make that leap... Well, all of a sudden they go from being 
you know, they don't want to lead their own lives anymore, and somehow or another they tend to get shifted to the fringes of the out, to the out. They become outsiders. And they're perfectly fine with that. They tend to adapt to whatever life they have to adapt in order to survive. Uh, Jason is probably the most extreme example because he's actually had to adapt to life in the woods, and he's done apparently really well, well at it. Freddy uh, has become a literal supernatural entity and is actually inhabiting people's dreams. Even with uh, light, he's having to basically adapt to a situation where, you know, he's in an inevitable cat and mouse game, and if he loses, well, he's history. So, in essence, you've got these people that are become ultra authorities over life and death. They've got black and white morality over which they become a judge, judge jury, and executioner to those around them. And they've gotten really used to surviving in the fringes of society. Sort of scarier when you think about that they actually have some sort of actual psychology going to them, isn't it? On the other hand, the person that they end up going to being opposed by is, of course, the dreaded final girl. Now, final girl doesn't necessarily have to be a girl. It can be a boy, it can, as long as it's an opposing force. In essence, these are usually sought out by... The final girl actually ends up helping the slash killer indirectly. And you're going to love this. First off, the slash killer is going to notice a group of, well, targets. Let's go with teenagers because we're going to be using them a lot. Because they're just convenient. And let's get real. The older we get, the more we tend to appreciate the slash killer. Um, yeah. Who hasn't met a couple of teenagers they've wanted to see grisly things happen to? You know what I mean? So, with that in mind, what we're looking at is the slash killer will actually tend to focus on some sort of well, final girl who is a shining beacon of morality. He'll notice that all the teenagers around him, or around her rather, have, well, mor definite moral feelings. They're into drugs, they're into alcohol, uh, they're heavy into sex, you know, all the standard stuff teenagers are into with all the rebellion going on. And, well, he's going to basically decide to test the final girl. The neat thing is that this sort of ends up having a really neat strategic effect. That is, since everybody's going to start figuring out at some point in time that there's some death going on, the slash killer will leave bodies and in some cases will just leave other forms of evidence behind and the teen even the teenagers will figure it out eventually. Um, they're going to try to figure out that Somewhere along the line, they're going to have to come together and for mutual defense. And, of course, that means they're all going to cluster around the final girl, even if it happens to be coincidentally. They're not going to realize that she's the actual target of the entire mess. And in a lot of ways, the, ser the slash killer is actually creating the final girl in order to come up with some sort of ultimate opposing force. He's going to be testing her. He's going to just sort of give her opportunities to have moral failings, you know, give in to her anger, give in to her greed, or just generally have some sort of time when she's going to have a crisis of faith and fail miserably. The neat thing is that if she comes out of this moment of crisis, she's going to be stronger, she's going to be an incredibly strong leader, and she's going to have some really great skills when it comes to dealing with real life. Because keep in mind, a lot of these final girls start off as shy and humble. You know, they're the wallflowers. The people that are... The only reason they basically haven't had sex is because nobody was interested in the first place. Or if they weren't interested in it, it was just because she was there. And they were unable to go after somebody else. Yeah, I know. It's not a happy picture. It's a really nasty stereotype. But at the same time, keep in mind that it doesn't necessarily have to be a girl. It can be a boy. Yeah, it's just the serial killer will detect somebody who's got some sort of morality going on and start testing that person. And eventually, they'll hit the point where they've killed off pretty much everybody around them 
and only the final girl will be around. However, by then, she will have gained the ability to take on the Slash Killer. At that point, the two of them will have a final conflict, and the final girl will have a chance to use everything she's learned to overcome the Slash Killer, at least in theory. So yeah, I guess it adds a little bit more to the Slash Killer having a death wish. But, you know, like I said, we're adding a little bit to the mythos a little bit here to have some fun. In general, we're going to talk to major groups when it comes to the people we're actually dealing with. Obviously, we're going to be dealing with teenagers. And the reason teenagers are usually selected isn't just because of their obvious moral failings. No, so I'm not saying these are necessarily bad moral failings because everybody has to make mistakes in their lives. It's just in this case, the teenagers are, well, the consequences are a lot more dire. The reason teenagers are used are, well, besides everybody wanting to see teenagers die horribly, are usually because teenagers are a lot more curious than everybody else. That is, they're trying to explore. They're trying to figure out who they are, trying to figure out weird things about the area. They're looking for new experiences. At the same time, they're trying to rebel, um, usually by trying to figure out, what, figuring out what the taboos of their culture are and then breaking them. Note that we're usually talking teenagers who are underage drinkers, who are using illegal. Well, sex is obviously a major taboo until you're married, at least in theory. Um, by breaking these taboos, they happen, they're hoping to assert their maturity, which is sort of ironic when you think about it. At the same time, they're definitely attracted to danger. Again, that curiosity breaking taboos danger. They're trying to find dangerous places and explore them. Not just because they want to figure out what's going on in that place, but also because they get exploring that place gives them a chance to break taboos that they've been told not to do. You know, how many places that a teenager goes into have they been told explicitly not to go to, for example, or what brought laws they've been told not to break that all of a sudden they're now breaking. And, of course, obviously, they're looking for privacy so that they can, can commit the various sins that they want to commit. You know, these are not things they can commit to in, you know, daylight. Okay, sometimes they can, but let's get real. Um, you know, the hit and run accident where somebody dies or at least the body disappears. You know, usually late at night. Or, you know... Breaking the supernatural law of you're not supposed to do this, this, and this, and all of a sudden teenagers do that, that, and that, and bad things start happening. You know, if they've done something they were not supposed to, they've broken a taboo, it's had dire consequences, and even though they don't quite know about it yet, all this has happened way well out of the sight of regular people. So. Which is actually sort of not a bad thing to happen. I mean, if we're looking at it from a plot thing, that limits the characters. Uh, on top of that, it makes whatever it is a secret, and therefore something needs to be hidden. All of this works really well story-wise. But, notice how it's built off the actual psychology of the people that have actually committed the sin. On the flip side... You also have older people that come in specifically looking for this kind of stuff. That is, whereas the teenagers have done it specifically trying to break laws and get away with things, you have older people that are actually starting to come in and, well, you know, explore the area specifically looking for the evil. And, of course, these people have pretty much the exact opposite. That is, whereas the teenagers are trying to break taboos, they're trying to enforce the taboos. Um, they're not necessarily attracted to danger so much as they're trying to eliminate the danger. And even though they're still working outside in secret areas or areas where people shouldn't be working in, these older people, and again, I'm looking more at your Van Helsing types, you know, your monster killers, your monster investigators, the inquisitors. 
the crazy old coots that basically shouldn't be where they are. The reason they're doing this, of course, is because, well, they're trying to establish or maintain a reputation. You know, let's get real with Van Helsing. The guy's reputation keeps coming into question. That's pretty much why he does it nine times out of ten. Um, unlike the teenagers, they tend to have the money to back the expeditions into these weird places. Either by research grants, personal fortunes, you know... Or they just happen to be in a situation where they're being backed by a television crew to figure out what's going on. On top of that, these people are usually looking for some sort of challenge. They're just not the kind of people that would do really well in terms of a nursing home. Sure, they might knit or they might read really bad romance novels, but the bottom line is they're looking for some sort of challenge to keep them alive. And ironically, even though they're doing this to protect humanity, they just don't like other people. That is, whereas the teenagers are out there trying to do some sort of bonding experience, you know, we're doing all these things together, and so these secrets will become part of our common bond. The older individuals are going out into the fringes of society because there's basically no people there. So it's sort of an interesting little psychology. You know, you've got the teenagers who are trying to explore new territory versus the other people who are trying to, well, just basically be who they are. They're looking for, well, both of them are looking for danger. It's just looking for danger for different reasons. One of them wants to find danger because of curiosity and because of the glory. And the other one just because, well, sure, there's a little bit of glory to it, but it's mostly because it's a way to get away from other people. Sort of funny when you think about it. Obviously, these people are going to be dealing a lot in deserted locations. Yeah, occasionally they'll be dealing with, you know, bustling metropolises. But, let's get real. A lot of times when you start thinking slash killers or other supernatural entities, you tend to think more deserted locations. You know, libraries after midnight. Um, haunted houses. Creepy fields, summer camps, off season. You know, you tend to think of deserted locations. Generally, these places, there's usually hard to get to these places, either because they're a long way from civilization or because the person has to go through a lot of rigmarole just to get there. You know, obviously, if you're going to do a summer camp, you're going to be far away from civilization in the first place. And it's going to take you hours to get there by hiking and by truck or however, whatever motor vehicle of choice you've got. On the other hand, if you want to go to a deserted library, well, first off, you're going to break into the place. You're going to have to make it a point to avoid any security. And, you know, you're just going to have to deal with a lot of the urban situations. So, they're still pretty... Both of them are still pretty hard to get to. More to the point, from the slash killer's perspective, these places are easy to make into a sanctuary. That is, it, they can define their territory as a very specific location and then start building up ways to, you know, get their food, whatever food they end up getting. Like Jason, for example, is going to track down woodland creatures. This will have its interesting effects later on. Um, vending machines will end up being smashed or otherwise have a lot of stuff stolen out of them. You ever curious why in a lunchroom there's going to be food that nobody knows who's taking it? I bet you the place has some sort of deserted area. You know, on top of that, the bottom line is that there's some sort of reason that a lot of people don't usually go there. And of course, the fact that there aren't a lot of people, that's why slash killers like going there, because slash killers really don't like people either. Of course, that's not, not like a major shock, right? So, they've got their cute little established territory. Other people come into that territory, they're going to get judged by the slash killer, and nine times out of ten they're not going to be leaving that particular territory. 
The Slash Killer will usually also have some sort of signature weapon. Obviously, this has some really nifty advantages as far as the Slash Killer goes because that means that this person is able to develop all sorts of focused training as far as this particular weapon goes. If it's a knife, they're going to know, you know, slashing first, obviously. Um, have you noticed that the weapons tend to be a little bit different than just like a standard weapon? They tend to be have something weird about them? Nonetheless, if they need to find something new, or sorry, if something happens to that weapon, the weapon is usually not going to be too unique. They're going to be able to find new ones. If it's a hook, you know, they're going to, a fisherman's hook will work pretty well. In fact, that's been used by a couple of killers. Uh, claws, again, pretty easy to synthesize. Uh, Jason's known for his machete. Yeah, he tends to use a lot of improvised weapons, but he's best known for his machete. Um, and so on and so forth. Occasionally, you will get something that's a little bit more esoteric. The Death Note is probably a good example, is obviously a good example of that. But even in Death Note, they were able to figure out ways of dealing with it in terms of losing it and still getting it back. In fact, there was actually a couple of plots which developed strictly to that. The obvious advantage to having a trademark is that it helps to add to a little bit of the terror. You know, if you know somebody, and a lot of people in that particular area die via hook, that hook is going to create terror in and of itself. Or if you see a lot of slash marks, you know, the, all those little details add to the reputation of the killer. And by adding to the reputation of the killer, it defines an area you do not want to go to because you know, based on the trademark wounds being inflicted, that obviously somebody's hunting in that area. You know, for teenagers, this is going to be an obvious thrust because there's something they can go into and either try to tackle or try to avoid. The monster hunters, all of a sudden that becomes a dead giveaway that, hey, there's, this, there's an excuse to go into that area. But for average people, that adds, that trademark adds a lot of terror. So, interestingly enough, and something that's not really brought up, but it I understand why. It's, here's where we go meta for just a moment because it's sort of an interesting one. Have you ever noticed in horror movies and horror comics, the only time you see animals is when they're important to the plot? Think about it. All the Jason movies happen in the middle of the woods. Do you see, ever see deer or birds? I mean, sure. You, in a lot of movies, you'll see ravens. You'll see, you know, animals that are there specifically to you know, for omens and that sort of thing. But past that, do you notice in a lot of horror movies you don't see a lot of animals? I mean, you don't even see pets. You don't see people bringing dogs into the wilderness, for example. You know, you're going to go into a summer camp, you'd think somebody would bring a cat or even a pet goldfish or something. Apparently pets are just way too domesticated and so they're pretty much kept out of the picture. They're kept home. You know, where they're nice and safe. Of course, it's worth noting that if there were animals in, in, in a slash killer's area, they were probably hunted down. And a lot of them learned really quick not to be in that area. It's just not healthy for them. Making the animals probably a little bit more intelligent than humans in this situation. Of course, if the animals are brought into it, they usually make pretty much the, uh, well, the first target. That is the first to disappear. Just because I'm a nice guy. Yes, it's worth knowing that there is a cat that's relatively well known as being a survival of horror. Just check out the Alien movies. But, generally speaking, there are no pets allowed in horror movies. Or, and especially not horror comics. Which is sort of weird when you think about it. It's sort of like, if you want to look at this as symbolic-wise, a pet basically provides a, you know, a, an area of security. You know, you don't go to a pet just because they're cute and fluffy, but you go to a pet because they provide a nice sense of security. By removing that sense of security, you actually help embolden the terror a lot. So, 
you know, there's a meta reason not to have the animals, but it's sort of look interesting to find out that you think about it, that if you don't, you know, you definitely want to have no animals because, well, there's some actually good real life reasons for not having animals. Like I said, they're going to be the first to be tra tracked down and killed. Um, Obviously, you'll provide a food source, so a lot of the animals will learn not to go to that area. But nonetheless, it's sort of interesting to realize that there's no a lot of animals in horror movies. Unless, of course, the horror movie happens to be the animal, the birds. My personal favorite horror movie's got to be Squirm, which is about worms. Yeah, you see a lot of animals in that one. Don't want to, but you see a lot of them. Anyway, um... Obviously, you're going to see a lot of these uh, people coming in, the intruders, or the teenagers and the older people, first thing they're going to do is split up. And, of course, learn that this is a bad idea. It sort of makes sense because it originally it makes sense because each one of them has individual goals and they're trying to accomplish those goals. And while well, they can usually accomplish those goals as part of the group, which is sort of a team management speak for you've got to cut people that want to pair off and have sex. They're not usually going to have it in the middle of the group. They're going to want to go to the room way off center and get in some alone time. Um, you're going to want to have some guy who wants to go out and get some alcohol. He's going to part from the group to go get it. Um, even the people who do drugs usually will pair off because everybody else wants to do well other things. So obviously this is a way to establish privacy. Of course, later on, when they actually do establish they're actually the slash killer, all of a sudden they're, they're still going to do the stupid thing of splitting up. All right. Um, this, however, in the situation is that even though they'll have the major group, you'll have somebody who wants to prove how brave they are and go out and accomplish something important to the group's thing, like you know starting a car. And then finding out that the car's been rigged to explode or something you know once these people split off in the rest of the group to do whatever their mission for the group is it'll usually end badly for that person um in some cases you'll have somebody who just simply wants to get away from the group in order to get the thoughts together ironically they'll have a very lucid moment right before they die so yeah there's some splitting up is a bad thing, but let's get real. If you have characters, there's going to have reasons to split off from the group. And once they split off from the group, yeah, that's pretty much when they're not going to be coming back. Uh, we're also going to be dealing with a lot of limited tech. You know, unlike a lot of shows or a lot of comics where you have people who can access whatever technology they need to at the time, you know, you need a burner phone, fine. We go down to the convenience store, we'll grab a burner phone. Well, remember how this is a deserted area? Yeah. First off, a lot of the technology in the area will already have been salvaged. Um, if we're dealing with a camp, for example, you're going to find out that they're having to build a place from the beginning, this bottom up. That is, a lot of the, you know, knives and other instruments of cooking have either rushing to the point of uselessness or were the first things taken. The stoves don't quite work. Um, in an office building, the vending machines don't quite work. There's some reason or other the phones have been turned off or basically things don't work. On top of that, there is either no power or limited power. And of course, that power will basically go down to zero sometime in this story. Again, going to a camp lounge. Yeah, they're going to have a generator that's going to have its wires cut. Uh, if we're dealing with the library, well, all of a sudden, all the breakers will be turned off. And, of course, the breakers will be destroyed. You know, something's going to happen to the power. Anything, of course, that's brought in will be relatively easy to sabotage. You know, if it's a car, yeah, it's a great way out. Bet you dollars to donuts, however, that something bad happened to the battery. Or the cables were cut. Or, 
you know, it was otherwise made inoperable. And this applies pretty much down the line, all the way down to laptops and, well, cell phones. You know, either the cell towers all of a sudden stopped working, or they were just simply unavailable in the first place. Again, another reason that you want to take people out to the campground. No cell towers, they can't use their phone. That sense of isolation works really great for the feeling of terror. Uh, library, you'd be surprised how many libraries get really bad reception. Same with office buildings. In essence, the people will be pretty much limited to whatever they can carry. And let's get real, nine times out of ten, what they could carry was pretty much whatever they were going to commit their sins with. You know, you've got the drug person, druggy who's going to have a couple of pounds of whatever he was going to get high on. The person with the alcohol would probably not only have it bring in a couple of six packs himself, but will have a couple of the other kids bring in um, a couple of bottles of wine or spirits. Um, interestingly enough, even though the older people were probably should be a little bit more prepared, they're going to find out real quick that either they brought all the wrong equipment or that a lot of that equipment is going to be easily destroyed and they're going to be down to extreme basics. So, again, really great ways to cut people off from the resources. It works really great in terms of establishing a really dark and dreary atmosphere. Yeah, all of a sudden the resources they were counting on are no longer available to them. So, Limited technology. Gotta love it. Well, yeah. Unless you're somebody in a horror movie. And, of course, this means that they're going to have a weapons issue. Obviously, most people don't bring weapons. And when they do bring weapons, well, they're going to basically be whatever they can carry. Interestingly enough, the area itself isn't going to be really have a lot of great options, you know. Again, going with the campground, a lot of the various implements of destruction just simply aren't there, and you're pretty much left with garden tools. And yeah, the killer will have found the ones that actually are really effective in terms of weaponry. And clue you in on something: if you have to define your weapon as something that has one really good swing. And it's going to do damage? Yeah. That's probably going to be the worst item available. I'm looking at your hose. Uh, you know, your rakes. If you hit somebody over with a steel rake, and I'm not looking at the one that has that neat, you know, lightweight fan, but one of the more solid steel one we're all familiar with. Yeah, all these are really great with one good swing. The only problem is that 9 times out of 10, the killer is going to be able to catch it on that one good swing. And even if it does end up damaging the killer, the killer is going to basically shrug it off. And end up using the weapon against you. So, there are no real great options as far as weapons go. You're actually going to have to think of something clever. And of course, if you're one of the monster killers who brought in weapons, you're going to find out real quick that a lot of those weapons you brought in are pretty much useless. They're just not useful against the creature you're up against. You know, that's why you have a certain redundancy feature if you're thinking that. But again, it's just straight up, you're going to hit a situation where you're going to have a limited weaponry and you're going to have to improvise based on the situation. The killer, of course, will have not... The slash killer will, of course, have an advantage here because he will have already come up with some really interesting options and implemented them. Or he'll know exactly how to take something and use it against you. So, so how's all this sort of work out? <laughs> First off, you're going to have a slash killer who has a problem with authority and trying to inflict his black and white morality on the world. He's become a judge, jury, and executioner. And apparently he has some sort of death wish. This is where the final girl comes in. It's somebody who he's subconsciously trying to build up into somebody who can defeat him. And eventually two of them will have some sort of clash. And nine times out of ten, the final girl will win. Of course, 
What's really cool is occasionally Slash Killer will succeed. Of course, what's really cool about sequels is, nine times out of ten, guess who's the first one to die in the sequel? Yeah. The final girl from the first, from the last movie becomes the first girl in the next. And yeah, substitute comic as necessary. Um, you're going to have two types of people going after this. You're going to have the teenagers who are trying to, you know, look for, play, trying to commit some sort of taboo or break some sort of taboo, create some sort of bonding experience and experience some sort of dangerous thrill for their lives. Usually the last one. Flip side, you've got an older, more experienced group of actual monster hunters who sort of recognize that there's a reason that monster hunters have a high morality. Or, sorry, mortality. Um, yeah. This, of course, will happen in some sort of deserted area that will actually end up getting more deserted as the comic tends to progress. You know, you'll start finding out just how far away from... Re how far away from civilization you are, even if you're right in the center of it. Sorry, I love it when they use uh, apartment complexes as the center of the horror. There's something cool about it because you've got all this really cool right in the center of things and nobody can get to people around them. So yeah, your deserted section will become even more. On top of that, they'll find out that it's been established as a territory of some sort of slash killer. The slash killer, of course, will create more terror by having some sort of signature death or way of killing off people. Uh, they'll either end up with honeycomb in them, um, heart attacks, you know, of the mysterious kind. They'll have situations where they've had this really gruesome death, but there's no way that the killer could have gotten out. In short, the slash killer is really good at what he does. Or he has some sort of supernatural advantage and he's able to use that. You know, some sort of notebook, for example. Um, obviously, there's not going to be a whole lot of animals. This not only throws up a... Sorry, let me phrase that. There's going to be basically no animals, which will send up some sort of flat to the people coming in. Um, obviously, no animals means that there's some sort of danger in the area. Or... The danger will end up being the animal itself, or animals. Horror comics tend to have a lot of fun with that. Um, roaches, for example, that have been used to kill people. Obviously, for thematic reasons, at the beginning people will split up in order to accomplish whatever they're trying to accomplish. You know, find the tomes of magic that have the spell to get rid of the bad guy. Um... If they're monster killers, or if they need to set up a pentacle or some sort of base, and other people go out and explore. Yeah, they're going to have radios, they're going to have some sort of means of communication, but they're going to find out that those means of communication don't work as well as they wanted to. And all of this is going to create, all this limited technology issues are going to create an, an even better atmosphere. It's going to just simply drive people crazy. Um... And, of course, they're either not going to have a whole lot of weapons to begin with, or the weapons they brought aren't going to be highly useful for what they thought they would. So, all in all, you've got this really weird situation where you've got this slash killer who's going through killing people, figuring out ways to isolate them, not just from each other, but from civilization as a whole. And, of course, all of this will create this really nifty little feedback loop where the hair, hair just tends to grow and grow and grow. And, of course, he's trying to subconsciously build somebody up who actually will end up taking him out. And of course, you know, you can interpret the, you know, building up the person as much as you want. You know, there's all sorts of fun you can have with it. So... All sort of why we tend to enjoy horror comics. Again, we know the tropes, we know the situation, and I hope this has actually helped educate you a little bit. Hopefully this will help you write a lot better horror comics. And like I said, if you need some inspiration, well, like I said, go back to the EC Comics, Creep Show, Tales of the Crypt, and there's always a lot of really great comics out there if you just know where to look. 
So have a lot of fun with it. Talk to you later.